From the east to the west, we're standing proud. From the north to the south, we're standing proud. From the fields to the factories, we'll shout the word about our constitution is still standing proud. Standing proud, standing proud. Our constitution is still standing proud. For 200 years, it's kept us strong. It's made our people. Standing proud for the United States Constitution. That's what Americans want to do during the bicentennial years. Our Constitution should be in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest and longest lasting Constitution in all the world's history. Today we will explore why the United States Constitution is the fountainhead of our great liberties. How our Constitution enabled America to grow and prosper, becoming the most powerful country in the world. And what is in the four pages of our Constitution that caused these happy results and made people all over the world want to come to America? First, let's discuss what America was like in the years immediately preceding the writing of the Constitution. On July 4, 1776, 56 brave men signed the Declaration of Independence an inspired document written largely by Thomas Jefferson. The Declaration founded our new nation on an entirely new principle, that individual rights, including life and liberty, come from God, our Creator, not from the state. That the purpose of government is to secure these God-given individual rights, and that government derives its powers from the consent of the governed. For the first time in history, government was proclaimed to be the servant of the people rather than their master. The signers of the Declaration appealed directly to God to justify their right to exercise sovereign power in an independent nation. The Declaration of Independence has five references to God. God as creator of all men. God as the source of all rights. God as the supreme lawmaker, God as the world's supreme judge, and God as our patron and protector. The Declaration proclaims God's existence as a self-evident truth which requires no further discussion or debate. The Declaration is the religious and philosophical foundation of our American political system. The Declaration of Independence was followed by our eight-year war for independence against England. The fate of our nation hung in the balance many times during those years of bitter fighting. When the war was finally won and Washington accepted the surrender of Cornwallis at Yorktown, the next task was to negotiate a peace treaty with England. Fortunately, America had peacemakers who had as much vision and determination as the patriots who had risked their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor on the battlefield, and who understood that in peace as well as in war, there is no substitute for victory. Our three negotiators were John Adams, who later became our second president, John Jay, who later became our first Chief Justice, and Benjamin Franklin, our most distinguished diplomat. Their three years of negotiations produced the Treaty of Paris, signed on September 3, 1783, the most successful treaty we ever signed. The goal of our negotiators was not peace, but was perpetual American independence. Our negotiators knew that our independence would always be in jeopardy if Britain were allowed to keep troops in Maine, South Carolina, and Georgia, or if the British and the Spanish were allowed to remain in the area west of the Alleghenies to the Mississippi River. So our negotiators held firm to a no-compromise, hard-line determination to pursue victory at the peace table, and they succeeded. By the Treaty of Paris, England not only recognized the United States as free, sovereign, and independent,
but recognized our mastery over territory twice as large as the original 13 colonies. By the stroke of a pen, America was no longer just a confederation of 13 states along the Atlantic coast, but was a territory that stretched to Canada on the north, the Mississippi River on the west, and Florida on the south. The next question was, what would we do with our independence and freedom? What kind of government would we create? The American government, which functioned during the Revolutionary War, was set up under the Articles of Confederation. That first government was not adequate to cope with the problems of war, peace, or commerce. It had no single executive and no courts to resolve disputes. It had no power to tax in order to pay our soldiers. It had no power to regulate interstate or foreign trade. And it could not act except by unanimous consent. The Articles of Confederation designed a federation of sovereign, jealous states rather than a national government to protect the God-given rights of free people. After the Treaty of Paris, 1783 and then 1784, 1785, it became increasingly apparent that we desperately needed a government to preserve the freedom and independence we had won. At George Washington's residence, Mount Vernon, in 1785, our founding patriots began to discuss the need to revise the Articles of Confederation. The Virginia legislature called for a trade conference to meet in Annapolis, Maryland in September 1786. Delegates came from only five states. The Annapolis Convention accomplished only one thing. James Madison of Virginia met with Alexander Hamilton of New York, and they decided to ask the Continental Congress to call a convention of the 13 states to revise the Articles of Confederation. The convention opened at Independence Hall in Philadelphia on May 25, 1787. Fifty-five delegates representing 12 states eventually attended. They passed a resolution to keep their meetings closed and secret, and then they buckled down to serious work in the non-air-conditioned meeting room of Independence Hall. The 55 men who met and debated that hot summer in Philadelphia from May 25th to September 17th were men of extraordinary vision, wisdom, and commitment. They had a shared sense of mission and of political values. The steady hand at the helm was General George Washington, who was unanimously elected convention president. He made no speeches during the convention, but the force of his personal leadership, plus his prestige as commander of our victorious revolutionary army, kept the argumentative delegates on course. Washington stated, if to please the people we offer that which we ourselves disapprove, how can we afterwards defend our work? Let us raise a standard to which the wise and honest can repair. The event is in the hand of God. The senior citizen at the convention was Benjamin Franklin, diplomat, inventor, business success, and world-renowned statesman. After the first month of convention sessions had produced little progress, Dr. Franklin made a speech to warn his fellow delegates that if they failed to produce a workable constitution, future generations might conclude that mankind is not capable of self-government and then leave government to chance, to conquest, and to war. That's how most governments have been created. Ben Franklin urged the delegates to pray daily for the success of their mission. He said, I have lived a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. I firmly believe this, Franklin said, and I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall not succeed in building a constitution. The Philadelphia Convention was a gathering of very young men. The average age of the delegates was only 41, even including Ben Franklin at 81. But they were men who were well read in the great books of social, political, and economic theory. They were also men who knew that freedom isn't free. 
23 of the men who signed the Constitution had been soldiers during the American Revolution. Both a study of history and first-hand experience had taught the Founding Fathers about the defects of all previous forms of government. The delegates were sent to Philadelphia for the express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation. But one delegate from Virginia, who lived in a beautiful home in Orange County called Montpelier, arrived with the vision of forming an entirely new government. James Madison believed that the Articles of Confederation were hopelessly defective and that they should be completely replaced by an entirely different constitutional structure. On June 19, Madison made a moving speech in which he argued that the convention must come up with a constitution for the ages. James Madison was only 36 years old, but he already had experience in constitution writing because he had helped to write the Virginia Constitution. Madison's role in Philadelphia as the principal architect of our new and unique American system of government earned for him the title Father of the Constitution. The Commission on the Bicentennial of the United States Constitution hopes that every American will read and study the Constitution until its words are familiar and dear to every citizen. Today, we have time only to outline the basic principles of the Constitution and the structure of government which the Constitution created. The first principle is our reliance on a written Constitution. Our founding fathers gave us a government of laws, not of men, a government whose powers and limitations were defined on paper for all to see. They rejected the British notion of an unwritten constitution which can change with parliamentary majorities or judicial whim. Article 6 proclaimed our written constitution as the supreme law of the land. The second principle of our constitution is the sovereignty of the people. The founding fathers proclaimed this in the first words of the constitution. We, the people of the United States, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. The American concept of political power is that government is the servant of the people, not their master. The third principle of the Constitution is limited government, the concept that the federal government enjoys only the powers that are listed and no others. The Constitution lists the specific powers of the federal government granted by we the people with the clear understanding that everything else remained in the hands of the people and the several states and that there are some things our government may not do at all. Even the majority of our people and of our elected officials may not interfere with our God-given individual rights. The philosophical foundation of both the Declaration of Independence and of the Constitution is that individual rights come from God and that government enjoys only those limited powers which the people choose to give it. The fourth principle of our Constitution is the separation of powers. Our Constitution separated the powers of government so that each section can serve as a check on the others and so that no one section can become powerful enough to gobble up the others. Accordingly, the power of government was first divided between the federal government and the states. The federal government was given specific powers, such as powers over national defense and interstate commerce, with all the remaining powers reserved to the states and to the people. Secondly, the power granted to the federal government was divided again into three branches, the legislative, the executive, and the judicial, each with its own specific list of powers. The functioning of our American government does not and should not depend on the goodness of those who hold the office, but depends on the restraints imposed by the separation of powers. After the three branches were separated into distinct units, then they were made to function together by an ingenious and interlacing network of checks and balances. 
Congress makes all the laws, but with minor exceptions, they do not take effect unless signed by the President. The President can veto any act of Congress, but the Congress can pass the law over his veto by a two-thirds majority in both houses. The President is Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Services, but only Congress may declare war. The President can sign treaties, but they are not valid unless ratified by two-thirds of the Senators. The Founding Fathers were very familiar with the way the British King had exclusive power to make treaties, and they did not want the American President to exercise that enormous power alone. The Supreme Court has the power of judicial review. It may not legislate or execute laws or engage in policy making. Those powers belong to the other branches. But the court can nullify a law by declaring it unconstitutional. All federal court judges, including Supreme Court justices, enjoy life tenure. But Congress has the power to take away or limit the jurisdiction of lower federal courts and the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. The fifth principle of the Constitution is economic freedom for every individual, combined with the concept that our nation is one economic unit. Among the most important liberties the Constitution was designed to protect were the opportunity to engage freely in any business, trade, occupation, or profession, the right to own private property, and the right to make contracts that will be enforced. James Madison stated at the Constitutional Convention that the security of property was one of government's primary objects. Both Madison and Hamilton believed that the right of private property ranks with the most important personal liberties. At the same time, Article I gave Congress the power to regulate commerce among the several states. This Commerce Clause in the Constitution was essentially a negative clause to prevent any state from imposing trade barriers against the other states. This clause resulted in making our nation one economic system. Every farmer and every craftsman is encouraged to produce his goods by the certainty that he will have free access to every market in America. The Constitution also gave Congress the power to pass patent and copyright laws, thus assuring that inventors and authors would have the exclusive right to the fruits of their labors and talents for a limited time throughout all the United States. This attracted talent and capital to invest in inventions which have made America the industrial and technological leader of the world. The sixth principle of the Constitution is representative government under constitutional procedures and restraints. The separation of powers principle mandates separate and distinct terms for each federal elective office. A four-year term for the president and vice president, a six-year term for senators, and a two-year term for members of the House of Representatives. Each office must be voted on separately. The president may not run as a ticket or slate with a senator or representative because those offices are in a different branch of government. The separation of the Congress into the Senate and the House was an inspired division of power which balances the interests of the big population states and the small population states. Every state, no matter what its population, has two senators now making a total of 100 for the 50 states. The 435 representatives in the House are apportioned according to each state's population, and the Constitution requires the distribution to be reapportioned every 10 years. All tax bills must originate in the House of Representatives, the body where every member must run for re-election every two years. The Founding Fathers knew that oppressive taxes imposed by an unrestrained British Parliament were the main cause of the American Revolution. The two-year term of all congressmen is one of our greatest guarantees of freedom. 
James Madison persuasively argued that the frequency of elections is the cornerstone of free government. The writers of the Constitution could not solve all our nation's problems. They could not, for example, solve the problem of slavery. But the Founding Fathers did give us a structure of government and a procedure for amending the Constitution under which that and other problems could eventually be solved. When the task of writing the Constitution was completed, then came the moment of truth. Would enough delegates sign the document to send it to the states for ratification? On the last day of the Constitutional Convention, wise old Ben Franklin rose to say, I doubt whether any other convention may be able to make a better Constitution. It astonishes me to find this system approaching so near to perfection as it does. I wish that every member of the convention who may still have objections to it would with me on this occasion doubt a little of his own infallibility and to make manifest our unanimity put his name to this instrument. On September 17, 1787, the Constitution of the United States was signed by 39 delegates representing 12 states. In writing to Lafayette in 1788, George Washington wrote that it was little short of a miracle that the delegates from so many different states should unite in forming a system of national government. James Madison wrote to Thomas Jefferson, who was in France, that it was impossible to consider the degree of concord which ultimately prevailed as less than a miracle. Madison also wrote that he recognized a finger of that almighty hand in the writing of our Constitution. Then the ratification battle began. Some sincere patriots opposed it on states' rights grounds others because of the omission of a Bill of Rights. To promote the ratification of the Constitution, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay wrote 85 articles explaining its terms. These articles, published under the name The Federalist Papers, are the most valuable source for determining the meaning of the Constitution. By January 1788, five states had ratified. The Constitution became official when the ninth state, New Hampshire, ratified it in June 1788. The remaining states ratified after that. As soon as the new government was formed, the first order of business was to write and ratify a Bill of Rights. These include the familiar guarantees of freedom of religion, speech, press, assembly, and property, and the rights to keep and bear arms, trial by jury, and due process. Ten amendments, known as the Bill of Rights, were ratified by the states and became part of the Constitution by December 1791. In the next two centuries, only 16 more amendments were added to the Constitution. That is tremendous proof of the near perfection of the original document, its structural soundness, and its vitality, even though our population today is 80 times what it was 200 years ago. Six of these amendments extended voting rights, questions not foreseen by the Founding Fathers because they expected all elections to be controlled by the states rather than by the federal government. The Founding Fathers were writing a constitution not merely for their times, but for the future forever. James Madison predicted in a letter in the 1820s, we have framed a constitution that will probably be around when there are 196 million people. For example, the language of the constitution is completely sex neutral. From the day it was signed, women have been eligible to serve in every position created by the constitution. In a remarkable speech on the Constitution 50 years after it went into effect, President John Quincy Adams reminded us that our wonderful American blessings are the result of our faithfulness to the principles of the Declaration of Independence practically interwoven in the Constitution of the United States. 
He urged us to lay up these principles then in your hearts and in your souls. Cling to them as to the issues of life. Adhere to them as to the cords of your eternal salvation. So may your children's children, after another century of experience under our national constitution, celebrate it again in the full enjoyment of all its blessings. John Quincy Adams' words are not just an old-fashioned view from the last century. Listen now to the words of one of the most popular contemporary authors, James Mishner. The writing of the Constitution of the United States is an act of such genius that philosophers still wonder at its accomplishment and envy its results. They fashioned a nearly perfect instrument of government. What this mix of men did was create a miracle in which every American should take pride. Their decision to divide the power of the government into three parts, legislative, executive, judicial, was a masterstroke. The accumulated wisdom of mankind speaks in this Constitution. From the east to the west, we're standing proud. From the north to the south, we're standing proud. From the fields to the back trees, we'll shout the word out loud. Our Constitution is still standing proud. Standing proud, standing proud. Our Constitution is still standing proud. For 200 years, it's kept us strong. It's made our people stand up from the crowd. Forum in honor of the U.S. Constitution.